Pastor Steve Eckeroff, he's been in the ministry over 40 years here. He's the director and president of E4 Ministry Network. He actually ministers to other pastors and other ministers, and he's been doing that for quite a while. And uh, Steve is a established and gifted pre preacher and teacher. And I've also had the opportunity to be in this small group and, and learn as iron sharpens iron, and so one man sharpens another. So Pastor Steve, come and sharpen us with the word of God. It is always a privilege when you are invited to preach in your home church when you're not part of the staff. Um, it's, it's one thing that to be able to preach in, in places around the country, but to me it's just very special and I'm very honored uh, to be here uh, this morning. And uh, wasn't worship wonderful as always? I mean, I just... I have to say this, and, and maybe I said it uh, a year ago, but uh, in my travels, we, we get to hear churches of all sizes, and uh, this church and our worship team, they're not only talented, they have the anointing of God. I, I know that there are some that, that have anointing and some that have talent, but sometimes those two don't always uh, come together in the same package, but we are blessed here at Canvas Church. Yeah, come on. I think that uh, when Pastor Ben approached me about preaching in this series, and the first question I have is, what do you want me to preach on? Uh, because uh, that's sometimes the, the, you know, there's a serious topic or something. He says, whatever you want. And my heart just uh, got excited because um, there is a, a word in my heart this morning that, that is very near and dear to me. Um, the uh, slide for the uh, mixtape series kind of it piqued my interest right at first because um, that vehicle is a Volkswagen microbus, and if we've got the slide up there, uh, I was born for this series. <laughs> I'm standing behind it in about 1958, and um, if we had that vehicle today, it'd be worth something. <laughs> but my mom, who's here this morning, I'm glad that she was able to come and join us. Uh, she didn't like that vehicle at all because it was manual transmission and underpowered and, and we lived in Duluth, Minnesota and in the downtown area in particular there's a lot of steep hills. And uh, I don't know if you remember the, the, the song from Sunday School, when you're up, you're up, uh, and when you're down, you're down, but when you're only halfway up, you're neither up or down. She got stuck in the middle of a hill one time <laughs> in the microbus. But all that to say that I, I'm honored and privileged to be here this morning. And I want to tell you about this message this morning because this is, as I said, this is something that is really near and dear to my heart. If I have the opportunity to, to preach in a place, oftentimes this is the message that I go to first. I've been speaking this message in various forms. It has certainly changed over the years, but on this subject of do something small for God uh, is something that is near and dear to my heart. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've certainly noticed that people are not motivated to do things all in the same way. Some people, you can challenge them to dream big, and they grab hold of it, and they run with it, and they are excited about a, a big vision. There are other people when you tell them about a big vision that it is an intimidation. Uh, they get a little bit frightened. They, they say, well, uh, that's not me. I can't possibly do something like that. I believe that God, first of all, before he gives us a big vision, calls us to do small things for him. It is not, it may not sound impression, impressive, but hear me out. This is where you start. You start with the small things, and then God does things that will amaze and astound us. The Bible certainly has stories of dreamers. Joseph was a dreamer. Uh, Caleb, one, one of my favorite uh, characters in the Bible, we named one of our sons Caleb. Um, he was a dreamer, and when he was 85 years old, he said to Joshua, you know, remember what Moses 
said, remember what the promise was, now give me this mountain. 85 years old, his dreams were still alive, but we may never be in a position like Caleb to ask God to give us a mountain. But if we are willing to do the small things for God first, uh, it will be amazing what he can do in and through us. Some years ago, I was at a conference and the speaker said something that remains with me to this day. He talked about those heroes in the Bible, the Davids and the Moses, and, and we look at the, the account of their lives and, and we, uh, we're in awe sometimes at how God worked through them and the miracles that came about and, and just the heroic feats. But what he said in this conference was, remember this, that there was a whole lot of living that went on between the miracles. Yeah. In other words, these people had to take care of the small things just like you and I do. Yeah. And if we don't take care of the small things, we may never be in a position to do great things for God. We must be prepared and willing to do something small for God so that when those mountains confront us, we will be ready to claim them for God. My scripture text this morning is taken from the book of Zechariah. And just to give you a little background, there was a sense of discouragement because the temple was incomplete. They had not finished it. It seemed like they lacked the resources, the materials, and perhaps even the willpower to complete the task. God spoke through the prophet Zechariah to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and beginning in chapter 4, verse 6, it says this, Then he said to me, This is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel, It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. You'll have to excuse me, but that, it's the New Living Translation, but that doesn't quite sound familiar to me. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's how I grew up. Yeah. But continuing on, nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, May God bless it! May God bless it! Then another message came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple, and he will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, I ask for your Spirit to empower me so that this morning I may bring this word of encouragement and support, Lord, for your body. And Lord, I believe that there are people here this morning that need to hear what you have laid upon my heart. Lord, I believe that we are to equip your people for the works of service, Lord. I believe, Lord, also that we are to engage this world for the cause of the gospel, to let people know that there's a, a God in heaven who loves them and a Savior who died for them. Lord, inspire our hearts this morning. Speak to us through your Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 They had laid the foundation for the temple almost 20 years previously, but the work had stopped. The resources that they had in their possession could not compare to what King David had provided for Solomon in the first temple. You can read in, in 2 Samuel and in 1 Chronicles the material list that David had accumulated for the building of the temple. And now they were returning from bondage, they were returning from uh, slavery in Babylon, and they probably lost their focus. Um, there was probably a desire but they just didn't have the willpower 
to see it through. The prophet Haggai asks this question. He says, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? I think that there probably were a few youngsters who were taken into captivity who remembered what the former temple looked like. They were now old men and women and they looked at what they had to work with and they probably got a little bit sad. They probably got a little bit discouraged because they thought to themselves, how can we possibly uh, come close to what the former temple was like? But the lesson is not about how much we have, but how much we are willing to give to God of what we do have, and then to see God's greatness at work. Haggai goes on to say, I will fill this place with my glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The critical thing for us to remember is that when God says that something will come to pass, it does not matter how small the beginning is or how many obstacles stand in the way. God will make a way and God will bring it to pass. I want to share with you four keys that I believe will help us overcome small beginnings and accomplish the purpose and plans that God has for us in his kingdom. Our first key this morning is to do the small things well. Sometimes we can set those lofty ambitions and we can have those dreams, but we forget to pay attention to the small things, and that is very important, and overlooking the small things can be a crucial mistake. Jesus put it plainly to us in Luke chapter 16. He said, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? The message translation gives us this Regarding verse 12, it says, if you are not honest in small jobs, who will put you in charge of the store? I told you earlier about the statement that there was a whole lot of living that went on between the miracles. Giving attention to, and I'm going to say so-called small things, because things that sometimes seem small are very important. Giving attention to the so-called small things is very important in providing a way and an opportunity for God to show himself faithful in our lives and in the lives of believers by doing great things that only he can do. You know, we had the series earlier this year called Rebuilt to Last, and then we went through the book of Nehemiah. Well, Nehemiah is near and dear to my heart. Uh, And in Nehemiah, we have an example of someone who, though he was in captivity, he served in his position with faithfulness, and he was able to lead his people in a reconstruction effort. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. The occupation required Nehemiah to guard the king against attempts on his life. Now... It's quite unusual for a king to entrust a foreigner to his, with his personal safety. But I believe that Nehemiah earned his position. We don't have the details, but I believe that starting from the very beginning of the captivity, Nehemiah proved himself to be faithful. He proved himself to be trustworthy. He did the little things. Whatever was asked, he did it. And he didn't do it begrudgingly. He didn't do it out of a a compulsion, but he did it as unto the Lord. 
So Nehemiah's heart was with the people in Jerusalem. That's where, that's where he really longed to be, but he had a job to do and he was faithful. But his heart was, was heavy, and when he heard that they were having difficulties, he prayed. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says this, When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord God of heaven, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. So Nehemiah goes into the king for great personal risk. You just don't do things like that unless you're invited. But he goes in with, with, with perhaps, I don't know if I can project, but if, I, if it was me, I'd be going in with great fear and intrepidation. He had served the king faithfully in every small thing, and because of his faithful service, God granted him favor. The king was favorably inclined toward Nehemiah. In verse 8 of chapter 2, it says, And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. God's results do not depend upon our strength or our resources. Instead, we are to be faithful in the small things, even the little things that nobody knows except God. Let me try and bring this a little bit closer to home and try to give you an illustration about how important the so-called small things are. Consider the importance and significance of various roles within the church. Um, we know that the, the, the pastors and teachers, they're there to be honored. The scripture says that those that serve well and minister the word, word well are worthy of double honor. But let's look at it from the perspective of a stranger or a visitor to the church. If I see the church through visitors' eyes, someone who did not know Christ yet, what would make an impression on me? Would I be most impressed by the sermon or the music? Or would the warmth and friendliness of the people make an impression? Everywhere I go that people know about Canvas Church, People that visit, they say that that is a warm and friendly church. They are welcoming. And I would say other things. What, what about the general appearance of the grounds? Now, right now, we're not much to talk about because we're in construction. But if there's trash lying around, uh, that's, not a, that's not something that is that impressive. You may not notice it when it's clean, but you notice it when it's messy, right? Um, I'm going to not divulge what, even what state this was in, in case it somehow gets back to me, but I was preaching <laughs> somewhere. And it was before the, the, the service and I asked it to use the restroom and they pointed me down into the basement. Um, that's not in our older buildings, that's in, in back east, that's not uh, an unusual thing. But I don't think they had cleaned that bathroom long time. I remember gas stations from the 60s and 70s and you didn't want to go into those places and this church bathroom was a little bit like that. So what I'm saying is it may not be the preaching of the word but how many people might have gone into that bathroom and said if this is the way it is I'm not even staying for the service. Do you see how important it is to do the small things or seemingly small things with excellence? Here's a quote for you from Mother Teresa. She said, there are many people who can do big things, but there are very few people who will do the small things. The small things are more important than we might ever imagine. Do something small for God. Second key is I want you to be encouraged. One of the most important things that we can do for one another is to be an encourager. I hope that when I'm gone, that people will remember me as an encourager. I've decided that's how I want to be remembered. God's Word is certainly a, a primary source for learning about God's faithfulness. But do not underestimate the effectiveness 
that our witness and our experiences and our testimony can have in letting people that we know find and, and realize that there is a God who is also faithful. What we do, how we encourage people, uh, it, it is so important. Uh, we need to let people know when God has been faithful to us. We need to, to have, I mean, we, we've gone through now uh, the Rooted series again, and one of the important things, if you haven't been through that, is learning to tell your story. Because your story will speak more to people's lives than just about anything else. One of the great testimonies in the Bible, one of my favorites, is the man who was born blind, and he simply said this, once I was blind, but now I see. Yeah. How do you refute that? When you have a personal story of what God has done for you, people cannot contradict it. They cannot refute it because it is your story of what God has done. It makes an impression on a person when someone they know tells them that God has been faithful in their life. Greater than if we read about it in a book and perhaps, I'm not just I love the Bible, but it makes a greater impression on people than even reading it in the Bible. I cannot emphasize, overemphasize enough the importance of encouraging each other, especially when we are facing challenges or difficulties in our lives. Remember, Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, but they faced opposition, didn't they? Yeah. We went through that in that series. From those who viewed it as a threat and did not want to see the project succeed. You know that when you start to do something for God, there will be those who do not want to see you succeed. Nehemiah did go to the Lord, but he also encouraged the people. Listen to these words from chapter 4. He said, so we rebuilt the wall till it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. They worked with all their heart because they were encouraged. There was somebody that stood up there and said that we can do this. God is with us. So, watch out that you are an encourager to other people. Everyone from time to time needs encouragement. Paul faced bitter opposition. And Barnabas was there, and Barnabas' name mean, literally means that he was the son of encouragement. I am confident that he reflected his name well, and that on many occasions as Paul faced bitter opposition, Barnabas was there. He was encouraging. Everybody needs encouragement. David saw that Solomon would need encouragement for the work that God was going to place in front of him. And these words, some of my favorite, from 1 Chronicles uh, 28, 20, it says, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Don't be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. He will certainly see to it that all the work related to the temple of the Lord is finished correctly. I want to encourage you today. God has work that he wants you to do and he wants to accomplish through you. We may be discouraged by what we don't have, but we must not be discouraged by small beginnings. God will not fail us. Amen. Third key this morning is God will multiply what you have. The third key involves the mathematics of God. Did you know God was interested in mathematics? When Jesus multiplied the five loaves of bread and the two fish, he did more than feed a crowd. He demonstrated a kingdom principle of divine multiplication. In the story in John chapter 6, Jesus saw the great crowd coming. And he asked Philip, he says, how are we going to buy enough bread to feed all these people? Well, Jesus, you're the one that they're coming after. What are you going to do? No. <laughs> Philip replied that even if we had half a year of wages, it would not be enough. Andrew then, of being observant, he spoke up and said, there is a boy who has five loaves and two fish, but how can that be enough? 
John 6.6 6 tells us that Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Um, I have to speculate here for a moment. Is that okay? I don't know if this boy voluntarily gave up his lunch or not. <laughs> really. But I really would like to believe that the disciples did not go all gangster. <laughs> or government for that matter and seize the boy's lunch. Wouldn't that not just leave a bad taste in your mouth if you found out that, that the boy had his lunch forcibly taken from him? I know it would, it would upset me. What I think is that that boy, after having heard Jesus speak and minister to him, was so moved. He was so filled with love for Jesus that he gave everything that he had. Amen. He wasn't, and, and listen to this, he wasn't expecting, or I don't think that he was expecting to see a great miracle. He was simply giving to Jesus what he had because Jesus had touched him and moved him in a mighty way. When we do small things for God, sometimes he will do great miracles. Sometimes he will do great things. But the point is, is that whether or not he does, we don't do it for that reason. We do it because he has moved us, he has touched us, he has blessed us. Amen. Understanding that God will multiply our efforts is important. Jesus wanted to make sure that his disciples understood principles of the kingdom and how as they stood in opposition to the way this world works. Do you know that the way the kingdom of God works and the way the world works are not the same? The world says, you know, you've got something, you better, you better keep it because you might not get any more. The way the kingdom of God works is when you give away what you have, he multiplies it and he expands it even to the point of feeding 5,000 people. Have you ever considered this question? Why did God choose us? Why did God, why of all the people in the world are we here this morning? Why, why has God assembled us here? Why, are, why did he speak to our hearts? Is it because we're so good? Is it because we're the talented ones that, that we have so much to offer that God looks down and says, I gotta have, I gotta have him, I gotta have her. Uh, is, is, that, is that why, is it because we have so much to offer God that that's the reason that, um, that he uh, has called us and, and made us his own? I'm sorry to burst your bubble if it wasn't already burst, but God has an entirely different criteria for choosing people. Paul's pointed this out in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those, in order to shame those things that are powerful. God chose the despised things of the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. We must understand that no matter how great our talents or our achievements is, the only thing that matters in this life is knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior. Even if we possess outstanding talent and abilities, understand that all of these things come from God. Amen. His capability is so enormous that he can take what we have and multiply it in a way to feed and bless our community and the nations of the world. The more you give, the more God multiplies. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. A number of years ago, there was a song that, uh, that I remember and uh, it kind of goes like this. It says, just ordinary people, God uses 
ordinary people. He chooses people just like you and me who are willing to do as he commands. God uses people that will give him all. No matter how small your all may seem to you. Because little becomes much when you place it in the master's hands. Bravo. Simple song. Beautiful. Simple song, but it speaks to the truth of what I'm trying to convey this morning, is that God can take a little thing and multiply it and use it for his honor and glory. But as we go to our fourth and final key this morning, the challenge is to keep moving forward. There are times when we're almost encouraged. Maybe this morning you're almost encouraged, but you're not quite there. Because you begin to think about your past failures, your past defeats. And all of a sudden, you're dwelling on what was rather than what is. You're dwelling on those things that were hurts, that were painful, those things that, 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 that you felt let down. You may have been told that you'll never amount to anything or that you're no good. And maybe those that you didn't have people in your life to encourage you and lift you up. Our best intentions somehow never turn out quite the way we planned. But we need to place everything in the perspective of God's great mercy and grace. We must keep moving forward in our pursuit of God. We must live our life in view of God's goodness. Despite opposition, we keep moving forward to reach the goal. Paul declares in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, this is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying and our, our spirits are being renewed every day, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Life can be difficult, and sometimes it's sudden. You're hit with, with a death that you did not expect, a loss of some kind, and it seems like it's more than you can handle. Winston Churchill said, when you are going through hell, keep on going. Keep on going. Thomas Jefferson, great inventor, said, our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. Great inspirational quotes, but I'm trusting in God. He said this, he said, I will never leave you. I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, uh, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? As I look at this key, I think back to the second key about being encouraged. The last couple of years have been trying for many people. Um, many people have given up. Uh, there are people that were here two years ago that they're not in any church anywhere, and, and maybe they're watching online, but uh, there's a lot of people, according to surveys and studies, that, that they have just dropped out altogether. I want us to be encouraged this morning. God will not fail us. One warning that I would give us as we get closer to the end, I'm not saying I'm ending yet, <laughs> is this need that we sometimes feel compelled to do, and that's to compare ourselves with others. That's a dangerous trap. Comparison 
is a deadly trap because we start measuring ourselves against other people and not against what God has given us to do or what God has placed in our heart. Galatians ch chapter 6 verse 4 says this, pay careful attention to your own work for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. We must remember that God places us and fits us into the church. Do not allow anyone to tell you what you do for God is not essential. Paul refused to get caught up in comparing himself to others even if they wanted to try to bait him in. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. He's being a little bit sarcastic here, but there were people that were tooting their own horn, so to speak. There were those that were, were writing their own press releases about how great they were, and Paul says, I'm not gonna dare to get into a competition about comparing ourselves with them. They measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. I got to tell you in 40 plus years of ministry, comparison has done a lot of damage in the church. It has done a lot, it's caused a lot of discouragement. And that, when that happens, we do not appreciate what God has given us. I want so much for you to be encouraged this morning. It is never about what you have or don't have. It's not about how much talent or lack of talent or ability that you have, because none of that limits God. He does not depend upon our skill and our, our ability. He wants us to be faithful. If we follow these four keys, I believe that God will provide a result in our lives that will bring him glory and honor. If we do the small things well. If we are encouraged and we encourage, encourage others, if we remember that God is the God of multiplication, He can take a little bit and make it into much more. And finally, to keep moving forward. When you don't feel like it, keep moving forward because God will not fail us. Uh, if the worship team could come and join me, just a little bit more here. If we try to encourage one another, if we begin to grasp God's ability to multiply our actions and our gifts, and if we make it our desire to keep aiming higher, there will be no limit to what God can accomplish through us. It is never about how much we have or give. Instead, it will always be about how willing we are to let God multiply what we have. Jesus observed people giving their offerings. You remember this. Some people were real flashy. You know, they kind of made the, they didn't have paper money back then, but they, they made sure that uh, people know that they were putting a lot of coin in the offering box. They made a display of it. But yet there was a widow Two mites, that's less than a penny. And I don't think that she made a display of it at all. I think in her mind she was a little bit embarrassed. Well, I've just got this little bit. What difference is it going to make what I give? What difference is my little contribution going to make when there's others that are giving so much more? But yet Jesus said she gave more than all the rest. How can that be? Certainly they didn't pay the bills or keep the air conditioning on. No, no air conditioning. They didn't have the resources out of her two mites. But Jesus said she gave more than all the rest. Do you know how she gave more than all the rest? We are still telling the story today of the widow who gave her two mites. Her testimony, her story is bearing witness and bearing fruit down to this day. 
Don't ever discount what little you have because God can take the little that you have if you are willing to give to him, give it to him, and he can multiply it and he can bless it and it can bless our community, it can bless our nation, and it can bless the world because that's how God works because he is the God who multiplies. Nehemiah or Zechariah said, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Would you stand with me this morning? I don't know where each one of you is with the Lord this morning, but I I'm making my appeal focused in this this way this morning. You may have been told by others that you'll never amount to anything. You may be told that your contribution really isn't needed or necessary. In one way or another, somebody has told you that you don't matter. But I want you to know this morning that you matter to God. You matter to him. He loved you so much that he gave Jesus his son to die in your place. And today as we are, are, are gathered here, you have an opportunity to take whatever little you have, even if you think that it's broken, even if you think that nobody would be interested in what you have to offer, God is interested in what you have to offer. And he wants to take what you have and multiply it so that you can be a blessing to other people. With our eyes closed, I want to ask you this. Is there anyone that will say to me this morning, I have resisted coming to Jesus and giving my life to him because I was afraid that I did not have anything to offer him. I felt that I was too broken or too hurt to be of use in the kingdom of God. If there's anybody this morning that would say, I want to ask Jesus into my life. I hear what you've said this morning. I'm willing to give the little that I have to the Lord. Today is your moment. Today is your moment. Or maybe... You've accepted the Lord, but you haven't, you haven't really stepped out. You, you've hid your, your, your gifts. You've hid your abilities um, away because you're afraid that other people wouldn't think that you had enough to offer. God is looking today at you and saying, I want to take what you have to offer and I'm going to use it to bless other people. Uh, in two weeks, we have a ministry fair coming up. But you don't have to wait two weeks to say, I want, I want to get involved. I want to do what I can for, for the Canvas Church and for the kingdom of God. Uh, if I recall correctly, the number is 858-943-2221. You just text TEAM to that number and uh, you'll go from there. But I want you to know this morning that what you do matters to God. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that, that uh, you have given us uh, your spirit. You have empowered us, Lord. You have, have encouraged us this morning. You have equipped us so that we can engage uh, this world for the cause of the gospel. Lord, we bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Uh, I'm asking the prayer team to come here. If there's anyone, if anything has touched you this morning or if you have a need, the prayer team will be here to minister and to pray with you. God bless. Amen.